Thank you. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Tinker. I uh, used to be with Seacom, as many of you would know, but now I'm with a company, new company called Transmission Core that I'm managing. And I'm just going to try and talk to you about, if the slides do come up, um, transmission services and transmission networks. Uh, being historically an IP guy, I've now moved over to the dark side so I can make some real money. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I'm just trying to find a way to simplify um, uh, transmission services and transmission networks. And it's great to see that there's a lot of transmission and optical uh, presentations at this meeting this year. Uh, so I think throughout the course of this week, there will be quite a lot to, uh, to understand from that. So it's just a bit of an outlook uh, through to 2024 uh, as to what to expect. A lot of these technologies might not come into South Africa this year, uh, but it's very forward-looking and we expect to see them at some point. We expect to see the slides at some point too. There we go. Whoops. All right. Okay. Um, so uh, first things first, um, it's safe to say that I'll try and catch us up so we're on time. It's safe to say that supply chain issues are mostly resolved in the semiconductor space, which means that uh, uh, deliveries, um, uh, manufacture lead times, and all that should be resolved. Obviously, ongoing conflicts in Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Palestine, and obviously, as we all know, the Red Sea with the cables that were cut, I think, a week and a half ago, is also some potential uh, to be concerned about, but by and large, we estimate 1% growth in the sector this year, which is a bit of a slowdown for, for telecoms. Um, on the 400G side, 2023 was about a lot of 400G, mostly for the content providers. 2024 will be a lot of that for uh, the telco. Uh, telco has had a bit of a slow start, mainly because they want things like uh, zero dB power, better monitoring, that sort of thing. Um, but we should see a lot of uptake for 400G uh, services, um, not necessarily in Africa this year, but uh, across the board for telcos, a little bit in Africa as well. Africa will mostly be the content providers, and, and the majority of the form factor will still be OSFP and QSFP DD, just because they're nice and small. There's loads of other form factors, but those tend to be quite bulky, and I don't think we'll see a lot of them in operation. Um, the interesting one uh, that has almost everybody up in arms is the expansion of, uh, of the wavelengths from C uh, to L and obviously a combination of C and L. Um, I think with the exception of Japan, uh, most of the world still runs on C-band. Um, and due to the improvements in coherent detection technology as well as uh, um, a high order modulation, for example, uh, we've pretty much gotten to the limits of, of C-band. Um, so one of the ways that we're going to see improvements in that for spectrum efficiency for this year and next year is some vendors and some operators starting to combine C and L band to increase uh, capacity. Um, in extended C and extended L, we expect to double that to 9.6 terahertz, which would give us give or take between 50 to 80 terabits of fiber capacity. Um, Later on, at some point, we expect to move into the Super C and the Super L. The combination of both of those would, in theory, give us 12.2 terahertz, 6.1 each in each band. Um, and that would essentially get, get us to about 100 terabits of uh, fiber capacity, depending on distance. It's all still very experimental. It's all still under development, but this is where we're going, because this is where we can expect to gain spectral efficiency before you need to add fiber uh, and all sorts of things. Uh, there's still a number of challenges with C and L. Cost is a major one. Um, uh, stimulated Raman uh, scattering is another, which is where you can essentially uh, amplify uh, C band into L band and cause a tilt. There's mechanisms to compensate against that, so all of that is still either under development or still being shipped by a few vendors. So you won't see it um, across 
many operators, uh, but that's where it has to go if operators are under stress. I think India is a good place for that. CNL in subsea is also being discussed, but there's more challenges in subsea because, as you know, subsea has a problem of power. Um, physical infrastructure, so the fiber itself, SDM, spatial division multiplexing, is where we expect to see um, uh, more improvements in gaining more capacity when we run out of spectral efficiency options. Obviously, option A is a standard single mode fiber, uh, where you've got multiple fiber pairs uh, in a cable. Uh, and to get that through, especially for subsea, you have to sort of thin out the cladding, which would obviously introduce risk. Option B, which is the multi-core uncoupled fiber, is where you've got multiple cores inside a single fiber glass, and then each core guides its own wave. Uncoupled means that they are slightly uh, uh, pushed apart. Uh, option C, which is few mode fiber, sort of sits in between multi mode fiber, 850 nanometer style, and single mode fiber. Uh, so, multi mode is easily about 25 to 30 modes, single mode is just one mode. Few mode is sort of in between, so anywhere from 5 to 10 modes. Um, and in that one, you're actually guiding an actual mode through uh, a, a fiber core. Uh, D is coupled multi core fiber which is sort of like B, but the fiber cores are packed together uh, just to give you more density in the fiber. And then the last one, which is very sci-fi, is essentially a honeycomb with a hole in the middle. Um, it's basically uh, um, sending light through air. And it should, in theory, be the fastest fiber because in a vacuum, air is faster than, uh, than, than glass. Um, but what we found with that fiber at the moment with the few that have deployed it is that it has a slightly higher loss than normal, about 1 dB versus standard 0.25 dB. It's still being deployed to some degree, but it's not yet anywhere near commercial use. The three I've sort of highlighted over there, uncoupled, few mode fiber uncoupled, is essentially what they look like um, once their system disappears. So the uncoupled multi-core fiber is essentially, essentially similar to uh, fiber that we run today, so you don't need DS, special DSPs. You can run them into the same chassis that you have today. Few mode fiber obviously requires DSPs to compensate for crosstalk of the different modes, as does coupled uh, core multi-core fiber. So all these are what we call novel fiber solutions. For the most part, we expect option A to be the more popular one for the time being, especially on the subsea side. Standardization and integration. So like the IETF in IP, uh, the optical folk have got Open Rodem. They've also got something known as OIF, uh, Optical Interoperability Forum, as well as OpenZR+. It's essentially supposed to mimic having Arista on one end and Juniper on the other and being happy. Um, the reality, though, in optical networking is that that kind of integration doesn't work really well in real life where they have actually uh, done useful work is to standardize on optical pluggables, right? So you can buy a ZR plus optic from Adran, you can get a ZR plus optic from Flex Optics, and that should work, and that's fantastic. And they're doing the same with 800G and 1.6 Terra. But to actually have a line system from one vendor, a core from another vendor, an edge from another vendor, and have all that together with the, with the standardized NMS, is science fiction to me. I have hope, um, but we shall see. But this is, so Open Road and we'll still keep on taking on new members. So if you want to sign up, feel free. Um, 800G pluggables are sh should be st starting to ship now. Um, so you should start to see equipment vendors, especially on the router side, switch side, start pushing out equipment that has 800G ports native. Um, Form factor is still quite similar to QSF PDD and OSFP, so it's backwards compatible. What's great about 800G also is that it can demultiplex down to 400G, 100G, and so forth. So uh, that should be mostly in 2025, but should start shipping now based on a 5 nanometer DSP. On the super channel wavelength side for the optical infrastructure, this is what we now call the terabit era. Pretty much every vendor now has got anywhere from 1.2 to 1.6 single channel 
uh, optical carriers. Uh, Cisco just announced with their company called, well, formerly Acacia, NTT Electronics, Nokia, and Infinera. Sienna did theirs on 1.6 at 3 nanometer. But the one that was most interesting was Huawei. Uh, Huawei did theirs uh, with, uh, um, well, are trying to do theirs with, uh, with uh, semiconductors made by their own SMIC manufacturing company in China because they are still banned technically from taking uh, semiconductors from the rest. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, but essentially, you're looking at those DSPs will essentially support anywhere from one tera down to 800G, down to 400G at different distances. So at short distances, you get a lot of capacity. At longer distances, they come in really handy as well. So we should start to see the channel can't go up 400G, 600G, that sort of thing. Um, single lane pluggables for 100G, especially in the data center. So for servers, uh, moving away from 25G, bypassing 40G, going straight to 100G, single lane. The majority of us still buy LR4s, which is 25G lanes. Um, but I think now we, st we started to see DR and FR pluggable shipping last year. I think that's going to ramp up this year. Um, I think a lot of exchange points, for example, in Europe are now starting to push a lot more of the single lane 100G. I think we might start to see that in South Africa as well. Um, so I think there's a bit of money to be saved by going with single lane 100G, especially if you run optical based servers in the data center. But also uh, between cross connects customers, providers, that sort of thing. So this will also pick up in 24. Another one that's sort of sci-fi, but also on the way, um, is to simplify uh, power management and cost for optics with uh, this one called the Linear Drive Pluggable Optics, or LPO. So essentially what this is doing is it's taking the DSP, uh, digital signal processor, out of the standard optic and then moving all that functionality into the switching ASIC on the device. So in your router, in your switch, in your WDM infrastructure. Um, as you can see in the bottom picture, the DSP is taken out and all that is simplified. So you reduce cost uh, by about 40% because the majority of the cost is the DSP and you reduce power down to about 50%. So you can take a 400G 13 watt pluggable down to let's say, you know, six, five watts type thing. And that's going to be a great thing if you have tons of them in a device that's heating up very quickly. Um, and then I think Prof just spoke about this before as well. Um, semiconductor sovereignty. Um, I think the Chinese have realized they need to go out on their own and we know leave the Chinese to do something and do it big. Um, so the big four, China, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, are still going to lead but you do have um, a lot of investment going into Europe, uh, especially around uh, semiconductors for things like uh, driverless cars and stuff like that. Um, giving out this year for countries, universities, uh, governments, and so forth, and private, uh, private uh, manufacturers to go out and start to localize, um, remove dependence away from TSMC, from Broadcom, NVIDIA, and those few companies that actually are huge at making semiconductors. So there's a bit of a semiconductor war, I think, over the next five to seven years. And just based on the numbers for uh, market cap growth last year at about 72% in just one year, you can see a lot of investment going into semiconductor sovereignty. Uh, this is going to be a big one. And to be honest, I think China is going to come out winning at the end. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, we're really running late, so he's here all week if you've got questions, unless someone's, someone has a really quick one-off. No. And Ed, could you give... Mark? <laughs> oh. And ben, ben has a quick question. Um, can you try the mic because it's, oh, it's broadcast? It's, it's on now, yeah. Um, ben, work online. Uh, for the benefit of mostly the rest of the audience, I think that probably a lot of people don't know what an optical mode is. Maybe quick explanation of that? An optical mode? As in multi-mode, single mode. Oh, okay. Um, 
So, um, in, in multi-mode, for example, 850 nanometer, um, you've got, um, how do I say this? Um, you've got multiple, let's say multiple carriers inside the, uh, the fiber cladding uh, to, to, to overlay and relay the signal from the electrical side, optical side, back to electrical between two devices. Um, and those multiple modes then allow you to get the amount of capacity and bandwidth required between both. In the single mode, you've only got one specific mode inside the core itself uh, that is responsible for carrying the wavelength and the traffic. Now, in few mode fiber, which is a combination of, uh, um, which is sort of sitting in the middle of multi-mode and single mode, you've got still multiple modes through um, the same fiber core, but not at the level of multi-mode. So about 5 to 10 versus 20 to 25, and that's essentially to help re uh, reduce the amount of crosstalk between the actual modes itself. It's a rather complex way to move light through a fiber, which is why the requirement for the DSP um, um, on, the, um, on the equipment and the end to sort of compensate for that is, is, is mandatory. Um, but yeah, I don't really think it's going to take off so much, but I think for short distances, it might. Um, a couple of kilometers maybe, maybe medium haul, I think it might do. Um, but I think uncoupled uh, multi-core fiber is likely to be more interesting. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thanks again.